Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here. And today I've got another interesting knife review slash knife overview to show with you guys. This is the <laughs> this is ridiculously overdue Les George VECP V3 non-flipper running on phosphor bronze washers. Wow. This knife has been around for a long time. Why have I not reviewed this? I'm sure a lot of you guys remember, I mean like years ago on this channel, me saying this is one of my favorite knives of all time and it has never actually appeared for review on the channel because I owned it and sold it before I started the channel, right? Um, yeah, uh, this is one of my favorite knives ever, but it's a, a personal thing, right? As we go along through this whole knife journey and collect what we collect and enjoy what we enjoy, right? We kind of zero in on things and some of those things kind of are stuck in a certain time period. And in the case of the Les George VECP, is stuck in a time period and has not changed since it was released, like, at all. And is still a knife that is popular enough to sell out when it drops. A lot of you are going to say, oh, great, another knife. He's showing us another knife that we can't get. I get that that's annoying. But first of all, I mean, I upload 14 times a week. There's tons of just my content over the last week. There's tons of stuff that you can get your hands on. I like to kind of diversify with my content and show stuff that is, in this case, periodically unavailable, but will inevitably become available again. Stuff that is just flat out unavailable and stuff that's always available, right? There's something here for everybody. This is one of those knives that we see periodically. It does come back. It hovers around for a little bit and then it's gone for a little bit. Uh, Les George is one guy. And uh, this is uh, a mid-tech uh, classification of knife, right? Or I guess you'd call it semi-custom, semi right? There's a large percentage of this that is production. And then there's uh, some additional manual effort in this, some additional, you know, human detail, human attention, right? I guess for simplicity's sake, mid-tech classification. Um, so if you go and look around for this, right? I got this at USA Made Blade. Uh, I have nothing set up with them. Scott, Scott Whittington is just a good guy and I like USA Made Blade. So yeah, check out USA Made Blade. These will drop periodically. I have heard that more of these are coming. So if you're trying to get your hands on them, perhaps you'll be able to snag one there. Um, but uh, yeah, I am very fond of this knife. I have reviewed the flipper version of it, which is the kind of the, it's not really an upgraded version, it's just a, a different version of the knife. It's basically the same thing with a flipper and it's running on bearings, whereas this guy is a non-flipper and it's the original version three uh, and, and it's running on phosphor bronze. Uh, we're going to get into it. Thanks so much to my generous patrons for supporting me right now. There's a link for Patreon right down below. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. I'm going to get through specs really quick here. Uh, overall length of the Les George VECP version three coming in at about just a hair under eight and a quarter. Blade length is three and a half inches and your cutting edge is about three and a quarter, maybe a little bit more than three and a quarter. How about some size comparisons? Just a couple. We're not going to do everything today. Up against the Ontario Rat 1. Um, and let's do the Spyderco Para 3. Uh, so there you go. This is definitely what I would consider to be a full size knife. How about up against the Benchmade Bug Out? for another size comparison there. There you go. I think that's probably gonna do it for most people. Let's go ahead and do carry profile. Go ahead and close this guy here real quick. Carry profile up against the Spyderco Pair 3. It's really not all that thick. I mean, I would still call this a fairly robust knife, but it's, you know, it's just not that thick of a knife. It's not quite as thick as a hinderer. We're gonna show it up against the hinderer here in just a little bit. Up against the PM2 and Pair 3 for uh, length and height, you can see here that this guy is definitely longer than the Para 3, but not quite as long as the PM2. It does have a raised area right here, but the Para 3 and PM2 are still just a hair taller. So there you go. I did buy this knife, full price, all that, yada yada. So this is part of my collection now. Um, let's go ahead and do a hardware check. I'll get out my tools. As per usual, my tools are very inexpensive and very recommendable. You can find them right down in the uh, description, the section that talks about my tools. The pivot I, is either a T15 or a T20. It's freaking huge. <laughs> it's a T20. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love that. More massive uh, pivot fasteners, please. Oh, it's so easy and almost risk-free to adjust. I love that. And then I think the handle uh, 
fasteners or the scale fasteners are for the love of all things that are good and beautiful in this world. There we go. T10. Yeah, T10. Curiously, T6 on the pocket clip screws, right? T10. Just two on each side. Oh no, they go through into the titanium. I've heard that that's bad. I have never had an issue with that. Um, I, I guess if you do strip it, if you, if you screw up the threads in the titanium, well, sure, that's going to be a pretty nasty deal. I've never actually heard of that happening. That is a big if, right? But truthfully, I've never heard of it happening. And that it's never happened to me. And I disassemble a lot of knives, for sure. Um, to me, I just, I don't really care. Does it look better to have screws on the other side? Well, yeah, sure. Um, but that screw goes all the way through and it's, that's a pretty secure system. Um, you have less hardware to keep track of. I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't know that I really care. I've kind of held on to that for a while, that mentality. And I think I'm still there. Um, let's go ahead and measure blade stock thickness. I think these guys come in at about 150 thousandths. Let's try. Oh my gosh, my fingernails. I'm so sorry. Um, I was cleaning. Uh, my garage today, and I obviously didn't wash my hands well enough. Um, yeah, okay, there we go. It's saying 147. I think it's about 150 thousandths. Caliper's probably off just a little bit. How about the inside? This is one of the only changes that I've seen since the version that I had back in 2000, gosh, 2015. Let's take a look. Oh boy, this magnet. There we go. Inside of this guy. Yeah, they have the front, the show side scale, pretty heavily milled. I, I don't remember my old VECP um, version 3 being milled on the show side. In any case, the end result here, what on earth? Is this running out of batteries? Oh, I think it's almost time for some new batteries in the scale. Okay. Uh, 5.11. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the, I don't know why I'm laughing. There's a, there's a brand. I hear they make good pants. Um, 5.11 ounces, not a big deal. Uh, the full tie Hinder XM18 comes in at 6.35 ounces if it's unmilled, a little less. I'm sorry. Uh, let's, what if it's, uh, let's try the Eclipse that's milled. 5.26, right? Let's try a Sebenza 31. This one's a little bit different, but okay. Sebenza's still weighing a little bit less, right? All right. So yeah, not a big deal. It's gonna to be too heavy for some people. It's like I always say, you know, do with that information what you will. Depends on what type of pants you like to wear, right? Depends on what you like to carry, what's legal to carry, right? It's just for your information. Um, yeah, okay, let's go ahead and move on here. So this is a very simple knife that is reminiscent of the oh, years, you know, this, this ancient time period um, known to me fondly as 2014. <laughs> 2014 was a special year for me, and this type of stuff was prominent. Um, if I remember correctly, the version 3 of this knife, because there was a VECP, uh, a VECP V2, and a VECP V3. Now, this is uh, based off of the Rock Eye Custom from Les George. You've probably seen it um, in uh, collaboration with Protec, because they make an auto Rock Eye, and that, to this day, is my favorite Protec of all time. I am a big fan of Les George aesthetics. Um, a lot of people think that this is what um, is uh, being made between Spartan, um, the, 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 the Spartan uh, Taiwan made knives where they've got the Les George looking, uh, I can't remember what that one, that one's actually based on the Talos. And if you've seen the Talos before, Les George makes a mid-tech Talos, and then there was also the ZT 0908, I can't remember, right? He also had the Harpy. Maybe the Harpy was a 0909, right? The Harpy's based on the custom Harpy. Kind of confusing the Les George models between, um, you know, with, with all the col uh, collaborations. And then, of course, his mid-tech and custom variants, right? Um, so, yeah, that might be where you've seen this before. We don't have a production manual version of this knife. We have a production automatic version. I mean, production collaboration version, right? This would be a cool knife right now to bring into the because this is expensive. This is an American-made knife. I'm going to tell you guys right now, this is a $425 knife. Oh my gosh, it's so simple. I know, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about it. Um, but um, this, uh, you know, I've got, there's a lot of sentimental value uh, with this thing and me. There's a lot of good here. This is a, this is a good, like if you just, you just want to know, is it a good design, right? Is it good, is it, is it going to last? Like I don't care if it doesn't have all the fancy stuff that we see in like 2021, right? 
Um, is it is it well designed as well? Yeah, it's stupidly well made. It's just really, really simple, right? Um, so yeah, you're, those folks, if that's what you're looking for, you're gonna be happy. You don't have to watch the video anymore, right? You can stop here at 10 minutes. This is a great knife to bring to the production world around the $200 price point, 150. I don't think I want to see it being built for about a hundred bucks. I think I would like to, I would just love if, if Zero Tolerance would, would collab with um, Les George again to do a production ZT VECP. <laughs> Can you imagine all the letters and numbers? <laughs> The ZT VECP V3, and then they add a number to it. <laughs> oh, God. All of the numbers and all of the alphabet together in one knife. Yeah, but seriously, I would like to see that because this is something that I think would be a lot easier for people um, to, you know, uh, give it a shot if it was around the $200, $250 price point, right? Um, these are small batch. These are American made, right? Les George, as far as I know, is one guy with a small shop. He can't pump this stuff out like zero tolerance. He can't pump this stuff out like some of the, um, the larger production companies that are here in the United States using exactly the same materials. It's simply going to cost a little bit more. Is it worth 425 bucks? That's really going to be up to the individual. I paid for this because I have an enormous, right? There's just, there's a part of me that just enjoyed this so much during the time period where I was exploring uh, the knife world, the more expensive I had, I had bought a Hinder XM18 and I was like, okay, I kind of understand what it is that I'm looking for at this price point. I want to see what else is out there. I had bought knives off the secondary market and brand new. And then I turned around and sold them when I figured out it's not really what I'm looking for. This was one of my favorite things um, to come out of, uh, that whole venture, right? While I was like really learning and trying to figure out what I wanted. Not just for that time. I mean, this was, this is one of my favorite knives ever. This knife uh, alongside the, uh, Hinder XM18 and the Eclipse and countless others. Uh, I know I just named two Hinderers, but this knife really kind of shaped like what it was that I was looking for in a knife aesthetically and functionally, right? There's a lot of good here. There's some weird corks, right? Stuff that I didn't know annoyed me until a few years later when I handled some things that were better, right? But this was far and away one of my favorite things then. Um, let's go ahead and uh, talk about this here real quick. So for I always talk about these being the Les George VECP, both the flipper and the non-flipper, uh, and the Talos, specifically these mid-tech versions, being having just an oddly glassy smooth surface. Not the, the, the action itself is smooth, but I mean, for whatever reason, the, the finish on the titanium, right? It just looks like regular tumbling, right? And uh, same with the blade. It looks like regular tumbling. It looks good, right? It's all monochromatic. But it has this unnaturally glassy feeling to it. And I don't know what it is. This is still the case now in 2021. It's been six years or so since I've owned this knife. And I was so happy to find out that this thing feels exactly the same. Um, back in 2014, this felt substantially better than everything else that I've handled. And now experience it again in 2021, right? There's some crazy cool stuff out there. There's some stuff that's wildly impressive and different, right? But this still has that really high quality feeling. I mean, I'm not going to say that, you know, this is, uh, how do I put Like people uh, put stuff up on a pedestal like the fall shut action, right? Uh, stuff like that. This doesn't have fall shut action. It's on phosphor bronze washers, but it has that unmistakable yet undescribable X factor where you pick it up and you handle it, you open it, you close it, you listen to it, and you, f you know, use all of your senses to kind of be absorbed by it. And you're like, this is just nice. It's so simple and straightforward, but it just is. They're just, they're just made really, really well. I very much appreciate this. They're, they're simple, but the nice oversized fasteners, right? I love the ergonomic lines. That pocket clip, that bill, that, uh, you know, back when I first bought this, I remember just, it, I, it didn't even register, right? Because I was so, you know, probably because I was like, well, I just spent, I think I bought one on the secondary market for $365. It was just, it's a lot of money, right? 
So I was kind of, uh, you know, numb to that, or I was kind of like subconsciously avoiding admitting that there might be a fault with it because I really wanted it to be a perfect knife. Um, but uh, yeah, that bill is just ridiculous. It's way too, I mean, it goes in and out of the pocket, no problem, right? Because the, because it's so high. There's no, I don't know how thick the pocket seams on your pants need to be for that not to work. One hand in and out of the pocket, it's fine. Pocket clip position, oh, one of the things that I complain about more than anything else. I make fun of this all the time. Prioritization of the lanyard hole. That's, that's I hate that, right? Um, now, the, the knife still doesn't carry uh, shallow by any stretch of the imagination, but it's more shallow than it needs to be. Um, not that if it were deeper, it would be superior, but it's like the lanyard, the lanyard hole, just put it over here and put the pocket clip up higher, right? It might look weird, I don't know. There's probably a million reasons why he didn't do that, but he just didn't. I love that he uses the Hinder LBS disc. If I'm not mistaken, I think Les George got some pointers or something or worked with Rick Hinder a long time ago and got permission to use that LBS disc um, on, on the knife. So that's cool that it acts as the over travel stop and the stabilizer. Um, I've always liked when those are there, right? These come in a, a few different um, texture patterns. They've got the plain stone wash. This is the one I went with. They've got some weird lines and things like that. Um, Monkey Edge used to do a frag version of this, which I thought was far and away the coolest version. They did kind of a faux bolster milling, and then they did frag. They should do that again. Uh, truthfully, I just want to see a version of this with a continuous, like a set pattern that's covering all of this area. I would just love to see that, right? Um, spoiler alert, this video is going to end with me calling for a V4, right? That's kind of what I'm getting at. Um, the thumb studs, I absolutely love the thumb studs, how they look. Um, they are positioned really well for deployment, but not so great when it comes to the cutting path. They are definitely in the cutting path. And you're also, as far as where you're gripping it, right? This is the last area that makes sense to grip. I mean, like, yeah, you can go up here, but it's not a good idea to go up there. All right, putting your finger right here, you're quite a ways from the cutting edge, right? So, I mean, like, the cutting edge is right here, right? So if you're cutting this way, it's fine. But as far as, like, a straight down cut, you're all about an inch away, right? The thumb studs probably could be a little bit higher. I don't know. I mean, they have to clear this area right here as it comes around. So it's, look at that. He doesn't really have a whole lot of room. So keeping the whole VECP profile but allowing for the thumb studs to be positioned in a way that they're not directly in the lar a large portion of the initial cutting path might be kind of tricky. But I don't make the knives. I have the easy job. I just sit here and go, I like this and I don't like that, right? I'm the annoying. <laughs> That's what I do. However, deploying it, it's in a great spot. And you can absolutely do the reverse flick. For being on phosphor bronze, they are smooth. It is definitely a little bit more, it's not false shut, but it's a little bit easier to get it to do that than, you know, say a Sabenza. And actually, since we're on that topic, the Les George VECP version three is what happens when you cross a Sabenza with an XM18. It is exactly in between. It's got a little bit more of that aggressive tactical look that comes with the hinderer. Sorry, we were off screen there. It's about the same size, right? But it's got a little bit more of the classy refinement that comes with the Sabenza and it's running on um, phosphor bronze like the Sabenza. I mean, it is, a perfect combination of XM18 and Sabenza. And it is, you know, the XM18 and the Sabenza are, I'd say, are even, they're in the same type of situation where, like, the XM18 has not changed <laughs> other than the triway pivot system and the fit and finish and tolerances and things like that, the flipping action. The XM18 hasn't really changed that much since Gen 1 back in 2010 or whenever that came out. The Sabenza? Uh, I mean, this is the Sabenza 31, there was the 21, and then there was the original Sabenza. Um, and that originally came out in 1999, right? So it's like, we can sit here and critique like, you know, that's an old design, it's been that way forever. I mean, look at these two, powerhouses right now in 2021. Yes, they have been updated. Yes, they've been altered arguably more than the VECP over its generational history. Um, but <laughs> I mean, they're proof that 
there are slight innovations. Yeah, the, the triway pivot system was a pretty big innovation, but slight innovations to medium-sized innovations sometimes is all it takes on a platform that's really popular to keep things going. The VECP in the batches that it's created in will still sell. I mean, if he made like 5,000 of these, would they be gone immediately? Probably not. I think these batches come in like 10 or 20, maybe they come in 50, I, I'm not really sure, right? It takes a few days and then they're, they're sold out, right? And then they come back. Sometimes it's in a few months, sometimes it's like takes over a year, right? I remember the Tantos hung around for a while and then those were gone. And then we saw the flipper versions of these and then those were gone. And then a few months later, maybe six months later, these came back. I was surprised. I didn't think we'd ever see this again. Um, but yeah, uh, very impressive action on phosphor bronze washers. And of course, the benefit to phosphor bronze is that you don't have to worry about dirt and debris. It's not going to be as smooth as bearings, but uh, I mean, geez, it's pretty darn smooth. Easy to deploy. The detents tuned really well for this. Reverse flick, all of that. Um, so it's like, do I really care that much, right, for him to keep dirt and debris out of there? Then again, have I really had that much of an issue with dirt and debris in my user XM18? No, not really, right? Depends on where you work, what you're using it for. CTSXHP, I was surprised to see that. I, I, I thought that he had permanently moved to 20CV because that's what they, actually it was 204P, Carpenter 204P being an analog to 20CV and M390. I thought that he had moved to that after seeing the flipper VECP. No, but he kept true. CTSXHP, a steel that you will not hear hardly anything bad about. Not a new steel, definitely a super steel, powder form steel, also by Carpenter. Uh, it's going to be a lot tougher, a, de a decent amount tougher than 204P. Won't have the same edge retention, but still very good edge retention and, and very, very good stain, stain resistance too. It'll be easier to sharpen than 20CV. XHP is like a stainless D2. And I think it actually holds an edge uh, a little bit longer than D2. And I know that that seems like, oh, a stainless D2, man. You look at D2's composition, uh, imagine adding stainless qualities to it. That really does put it in a whole different category. I mean, yeah, there's some different ups and downs with the composition, but CTS XHP is really good steel. Seriously, try to find something bad about CTS XHP. I mean, you, you can find anything on the internet, but you're going to have to work for it. CTS XHP is good stuff, especially, I think these are heat treated as 61, something like that. Love the finish. Big fan of the stone wash finish, right? There's a nice flat that carries out about 60% the length of the blade. Plenty of robustness carried out to the tip, but that tip is definitely still pointy. The edge is done perfectly. I have no issue with the edge whatsoever. Nice and just glassy, perfect, nice and stiff. Sticky. I love feeling that sticky, like the fibers on the dead skin on my thumb are popping, just, just barely touching it. Um, <laughs> in true fashion for the, <laughs> the VECP, the jimping remains basically decorative. <laughs> God. Okay, in a V4, like, even in gloves, I don't know whose fingers, the, it's so slippery. There's, this is so rounded off. It's so polished. I mean, it's nice to the touch, but the, there's no real traction to be, you know, benefited from here. Um, so even in gloves, I, I don't know. Corners, everything else is nicely and appropriately knocked down, but this area right here really needs to be, I don't know. I mean, honestly, Sabenza does it right. Hinder is a jimping. Oh yeah, that's going to catch your finger so much so that this landing zone is a minefield when you flip it, right? This is too much, right? This is a, too aggressive. This is not aggressive enough. This is just right. We have a Goldilocks situation here and the Sabenza wins for the appropriate amount of jimping. So that's what I'd like to see on a hypothetical version four. I'm not saying like Les George is like, I want to make a V4. I wonder what Metal Complex thinks. No, <laughs> he, I doubt, I doubt he cares, right? Just saying, you know, like this is the type of stuff that I, that I do. Love this uh, scallop right here. Just makes it, it's just a nice little area to rest your thumb in right before you, you know, uh, kick it open. These areas nicely chamfered. These are, this is not contoured. I can't help but think that this would just be an absolute grand slam uh, with some contouring, but okay. Areas all nicely. Now, every, there's no, no hot spot on this entire knife. It's a joy to hold ergonomically, except for that pocket clip. Some standoffs back here. These, uh, periodically you can find um, 
He did a little bit of the hinderer thing with the um, hardware, right, where you can buy, like, different anodized standoffs, different pocket clips, different lock bar stabilizers. He did a little bit of that. Um, I've seen that type of stuff pop up on his website, and then it's gone. Then you find it on eBay for, like, way too much down the road. I bought a clip a while back, actually. It was just a stainless steel clip with his logo on it. I think it was 30 bucks. Not a bad deal. The clip is super-duper basic. Um, you know... But, and, and I complain about clips and I always, you know, manage to leave Hinder. I always just kind of not, I don't bring up the Sabenza and the Hinder clip that are doing the same thing, right? These are stainless steel. Well, actually, hang on. Let's find out here. Sabenza clips, titanium. Les George clip, titanium. Hinder clip. I, I'm pretty sure these are steel, but for whatever reason, the magnet is not stick. That's weird. Could have sworn the hinder clip was steel. Magnet is legitimately not sticking to it. It's not sticking to anything, except for the blade. Definitely sticking to the blade. All right, I'm pretty sure the standard clip on the XM18 is stainless steel, but maybe I'm wrong, I don't know. In any case, it looks like uh, these, these are all apparently a titanium, but this is just a really simple, I'd like to see a, I'd like to see a, a you know, a 3D milled clip. Is that going to make the price higher? Well, yeah. In this caliber of knife, right? This caliber in the knife world, American made product, small batch. Yeah, it's going to add to the price, right? It just is. Pocket clip is very basic, has a bill. It's not prioritized over the lanyard hole, which bothers me. All right. Moving on here. This does not have a um, steel lock bar insert. Do we need that? No, I've always maintained that you don't need that as long as the geometry is good. In fact, a lot of people still prefer a carbonized titanium lock face uh, interacting with a um, steel, this, the, the steel blade tang, uh, because it's a little more sticky. It, it goals, it work hardens, becoming more and more and more properly formed the longer that you use it. The benefit of a steel lock bar insert is, of course, slower wear, much slower wear over time, but it's much more heavily dependent on the appropriate geometry because steel on steel is more slippery. And that is, uh, that's a problem with a frame lock. You don't want slipperiness at all. I think at this point, Les George, Rick Hinder, and you know, the, now the Sabenza 31, that's, it's not an insert, it's a ceramic uh, ball interface, which it's also acting as the detent ball. Right. I think it might be a good idea to incorporate something like that in a hypothetical V4. Also, this gap for the front, I've never liked this. The, this is not the worst gap in the entire world. I just want it to be a lot closer to the frame, right? Hinder's got a good good one going. Sabenz is okay. It's a little bit larger. I just don't like to see so much in there, right? Um, but is that really hurting anything? No, especially considering there's a lock bar stabilizer. So this guy isn't going to be traveling in towards the knife, even if you push on it because of that disc. Um, we do have a <laughs> massive, massive stop pen and some uh, shouldering there. So that's nice. Absolutely, completely and totally solid lockup. That thing's not moving at all. No lock stick whatsoever. No pivot lash. Detent. Listen to this. Click. Click. This is one of the knives that made me realize that I really like that click, that definitive, you know, clink into place. I don't like a flip, you know, or a thud. I don't, I just, ew, it feels mushy or like there's somebody stuffed Play-Doh into the detent hole. Now this knife clicks. It's nice, I like that. Centering, dead on, dead on. It's one of those knives where it takes a micro adjustment you micro adjust this thing and it changes, the tolerances change, right? Um, and that's actually a sign of really, really, really precision machining. So I like that a lot. Is this knife still worth 425 bucks? You're gonna have to be somebody like me who just found, uh, like there was a certain part of my knife obsession that solidified around the VECP. 
I love how this knife looks. I love how it feels in hand. I don't like that pocket clip, but my gosh, that is just a beautiful, simple looking knife. I just really, really like this thing. Yeah, it is using premium materials and it definitely is in the same cal. All right, if we're gonna sit here and argue about the price on this, you're gonna have to come at the XM18. You're definitely gonna have to come at the XM18 because this guy comes stock with G10 and is 425 bucks, right? You're not gonna hear a lot of people shopping in this territory, right? If you're somebody who has only ever existed in the $100 territory of knives, that's fine, right? But if you're not shopping in this territory or you don't regularly handle stuff like this, then it's really hard for you to critique it through a rectangle that is your YouTube viewing experience, right? It's, it's I'm not, that sounds like nose in the air, like you don't quite know what you're talking about, do you, so? <laughs> oh, no, I'm not trying to act like that. I'm just saying, if, if you don't handle this stuff on a regular basis, it's really hard to get a, a feel you know, for the difference between stuff like this and maybe a $100 or perhaps a $200 production knife, even if it's using the exact same materials, right? So if we're going to complain about this, you're definitely going to come at, have to come at the XM18 and you're definitely going to have to come at the Sebenza as well, right? Um, which is not going to be the case with, you know, at least one of those knives, people generally shopping in this price point who have experience in this price point, um, those people are not going to say most of the time, absolutely all three are massively overpriced. No, I, it's not that I want this knife to be cheaper. I think it's just time for a V4. This is, to me, this is like a history stamp, right? And that makes it sound like I'm, I'm dancing around saying that this is an outdated design. <laughs> In a way, it is. But so is the Sebenza and so is the beloved on this channel, the beloved and coveted and worshipped XM18 three and a half inch. Yeah, it is. Are they gonna redesign it? Probably not, because it's still selling as when he decides to make a batch, they sell because they're good knives and people still like them. People like me, right? I love this knife because it's a history stamp for me. Uh, I uh, This represents a certain point in time for me in the knife world and it is well made. It might not, you know, perfectly stack up against the, the heaviest of competition at the 400 to $450 price point now in 2021, but gosh, it's a good knife, right? Most of the other videos, you don't have to take my word for it. Look up some videos on the VECP V3 on YouTube. I haven't watched them all. I'm gonna venture to guess a lot of the people that have handled and or owned these knives, exactly these knives, probably came to roughly the same conclusion that I did, um, right? That's pretty presumptuous, I guess. Maybe that, maybe I shouldn't say it like that. I wouldn't be surprised. No, that still sounds. <laughs> well, you watch them and then you think what you want, right? Everybody's got their own opinion. Um, but yeah, uh, I do like this knife. I think the people that uh, and would enjoy it for the same reasons that I do are not going to have a problem spending, in this case, $425 on this knife, right? But if you've never handled this, maybe you got into the knife game here more recently. Let's say maybe you started in 2018, 2019, and, you, and you've only ever experienced the high end of the modern, like the current uh, knife world. <clears throat> this might... It, it'll feel, you'll be like, yeah, it's a nice knife. It's just like lacking the bells and whistles, right? It's like, um, you know, in 2006, you remember when the C6 Corvette came out and everyone was like, wow, wow. And then like you get in one now that was fully loaded back in 2006 and you're like, yeah, it's a Corvette, it's a nice car, but geez, like, have you seen the C, the, you know, the C8, <laughs> right? That's kind of the thing. Like, it's, it's, it's just, that, that's, that's exactly what it is that I'm saying in a roundabout way. So I love this. I think people who decide to go for the next batch, I think you'll like it, but it's not gonna be for everybody. Definitely gonna stay permanently in my collection though. I, I really kicked myself. I've said that for years now. I have kicked myself ever since I let this thing go and I am not gonna let that one go. Um, for a V4, hypothetically, all right, blade shape, don't change anything about it. And again, not, not saying Les George is listening and taking notes because he makes knives, right? I don't make knives. I just critique them. Jimping, this is what I'd change. Uh, something that's closer uh, and more, closer to the Sebenza, at, at least just, at, just functional, right? Um, this area I think needs to be changed to accommodate for a um, position for the thumb stud to be better so that it's not in the cutting path. I think that's possible, but it will take away from the aesthetic. I'd love for this to be contoured. 
doesn't necessarily have to be, but I'd love for it to be, and I think it would add some value, especially if you textured it. If um, you, I keep saying like I'm talking to Les George. It sounds silly, especially if it were textured. Uh, textured, contouring, right? A continuous patterning, or maybe more of that faux bolster look, or just something, right? Something to kind of dress this up a little bit more. And he does a little bit of that, um, but I, I think a continuous pattern would look really, really good. And I know I say that about a lot of stuff, and that's just my thing, right? Um, pocket clip, the bill, shave that thing down, um, and then move the clip up and move the lanyard hole over here, or better yet, just get rid of it. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, that'd be pretty killer. I mean, you know, I like here lately, I've kind of been kind of shying away from the exposed frame lock thing and really loving the countersunk titanium liner lock thing, but okay. I mean, one way or another steel lock bar insert, even if the, um, carbonized titanium lock face is a little bit more sticky and some people would say more reliable, you know, um, or more consistently reliable. I don't know. I've never had a problem with steel lock bar insert, and I think that would make things easier on a, at least on a maintenance level if knives had to come back to him. So yeah, I think probably a steel lock bar insert would, would be a, a better bet on a, a hypothetical V4, but that's about it, right? I mean, it's like you wouldn't, you don't necessarily have to listen to my review to come to those. I think a lot of people would come to those exact same conclusions on their own. As this knife st sits, I still love it, even with its corpse. Uh, it still brings me the same amount of joy that it did back when I purchased it on the secondary market in 2014. And I think a lot of people would still enjoy it. But like I said, it's just not going to be for everybody. That's going to be pretty much it today. Uh, thanks again, USMA Blade, for just being an awesome dealer um, and having these things in stock when I went to check. Check them out. Even if it's not this, they do have other cool things. Uh, um, that's going to be pretty much it today, guys. Uh, be sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.